On October 13, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571 crashed in the Andes Mountains with 45 people on board. After 72 days in the icy mountains, only 16 survived. Flight 571 was a chartered flight on that October day. The aircraft carried members of the old Christians Club rugby team, along with some friends and family of the players, and only one passenger unrelated to the team. The flight departed from Montevideo, Uruguay, bound for Santiago, the capital of Chile. However, adverse weather conditions forced an overnight stop in Mendoza, Argentina. After resuming the flight on the afternoon of October 13, as the plane approached its destination, co-pilot Lieutenant Colonel Dante Lagurara, who was piloting the aircraft, requested permission to land at Santiago Airport. The aircraft, however, began its descent with a problem. Lagurara and pilot Colonel Julio Cesar Ferradas had mistakenly identified the plane's position. Consequently, when the plane descended from the clouds, it didn't approach the airport's runway but crashed into a valley high in the Andes Mountains. The plane struck a peak at 4200 meters, 13800 feet, separating the right wing forcefully, which was thrown backward with force, cutting the vertical stabilizer, leaving a hole in the rear fuselage. Subsequently, the aircraft hit a second peak, separating the left wing. Following that, the fuselage struck the ground and slid down a steep mountain slope before finally coming to rest on a snowbank. Of the 45 people on the plane, 12 died in the crash or shortly after, including the pilot. Another five died the next morning, including the co-pilot, and one more victim succumbed to injuries on the eighth day. The remaining 27 survivors faced serious difficulties with freezing conditions high in the mountains. Many had suffered injuries from the crash, including broken legs from seats stacked together in the aircraft. They lacked equipment, medical supplies, and appropriate clothing for the extreme cold. Among the survivors, a second-year medical student improvised splints and devices using parts salvaged from what remained of the aircraft. Although the survivors found a limited supply of food on the plane, such as candy, wine, and jam, it didn't last long. Additionally, there was no natural vegetation or animals in the snow-covered mountain. Extreme cold and hunger had already begun claiming lives. Bodies accumulated, one after another. Those who didn't die, weakened. They came to a radical conclusion. If necessary, they would have to resort to eating the deceased to survive. I will never forget that first incision, when each man was alone with his conscience at the top of that infinite mountain, on a day colder and grayer than any before or after," wrote survivor Roberto Canessa in his 2016 memoir, I Had to Survive. The four of us, each with a razor blade or a shard of glass in hand, carefully cut the clothes from a body whose face we couldn't bear to look at. All passengers were Roman Catholics. Some equated the act of cannibalism to the ritual of Holy Communion. Others initially had many reservations, but, after realizing it was their only means of staying alive, changed their minds after a few days. In the afternoon of October 29th, just over two weeks after the accident, another disaster occurred. While the survivors rested in their improvised shelter, a snow cascade descended the mountain slope in the form of an avalanche, burying the plane and claiming the lives of eight more people. I almost gave up when the avalanche hit us, recounted Roberto Canessa, but then, one of the other boys said, Roberto, how lucky you are to be able to walk for all of us. That was like a heroic infusion into my heart. He had broken legs, but I could walk. My mission was not just to think about what was best for me, but what was best for the group. By December, the number of survivors had dwindled to 16. Faced with this situation, they had a choice. Wait for death or seek help. A small group opted to embark on a rescue mission through the frozen mountains, Canessa, Nando Parado, and Antonio Vizintin. The three young men would have to climb the mountains and hope to find help on the other side. The trio began their journey on December 12th. Three days into the expedition, Vizintin returned to the camp so that Canessa and Parado would have better chances of success with their limited rations. On December 20th, the duo spotted another human, Sergio Catalan Martinez, a Chilean shepherd. After the man brought help the next day, Parado and Canessa led authorities to the other 14 survivors. After 72 days lost in the Andes, they were finally all safe. The news of the so-called miracle in the Andes quickly spread worldwide. The joy of the rescue soon gave way to horror 
when the survivors admitted they had eaten human flesh to stay alive. However, they defended their actions. You can't feel guilty for doing something you didn't choose to do, Canessa told the Washington Post in 1978. Nevertheless, the survivors carried the memory of cannibalism with them in the decades that followed. In his memoir, Canessa explained, For us, making that leap was a final break, and the consequences were irreversible. We were never the same again. Although 16 young individuals descended the mountain, the remains of those who didn't survive never left the Andes. They were buried near the site where they died. The story of Flight 571 could have easily ended as a tragic mystery, a tale of how everyone on the plane had been lost in the Andes, but the survivors rewrote this story by saving themselves. Thank you very much for making it to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Also, share your opinion down below in the comments about this case. I'll be signing off for now. Until next time, goodbye.